So as Liana said, my name's Aaron. I'm a freshwater entomologist. Um, I was doing a lot of terrestrial entomology a couple of years ago and then fell into, not literally fell into some water, but I started studying freshwater entomology, but mainly on uh, rivers and kind of river streams, brooks, those sorts of water bodies. And then over the last kind of um, year and a half, maybe I've really started to broaden out into all sorts of different areas of water, shall we say, and started to explore um, freshwater entomology a lot more, which has even now led into more of the ecologist side, I would say, having started a diploma in fish, learning all about fish and macrophytes and interactions and and it all interlinks. So, but noticing quite a lot of the people on here today who, who have joined us, I'm sure there'll be um, quite a lot of spe specialists that will know a lot more than me about some of the areas. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go through the basics of the, I'm going to tell a bit of a story as we go through a pond. And I'm going to kind of cover some of the bits that I think might be interesting to anyone who's never explored a pond. Um, but I, as I said, I won't go too much into the specialties because I know there's been a lot of other different amazing workshops on a lot of different specialist creatures. So what is a pond? I, I find this a little bit, there's always a bit of a debate. How big is a pond and when it's not a pond, when is it a lake? So the Cambridge Dictionary says an area of water smaller than a lake often um, artificially made. So you can obviously get ponds that are yeah, artificially made, but there's also ponds that can feed into um, from rivers or brooks where the, the water is fed into a pond, which then obviously changes the species diversity if there is water coming from somewhere else. So when you start to look at the, the species di or, or the creature diversity of ponds, it gets quite broad and obviously, um, you know, looking at some creatures that I've never come across, where it says they find them in ponds and you start to dig a bit deeper and you know it's very difficult to find uh, if you know where you'd find them in ponds but it says that they're found in ponds so they're quite diverse environments but it's also important to obviously you know a massive pond would probably be a lake <laughs> a small body of water would be a pond so i'm talking about the small bodies of water man-made or natural that we're going to talk about today so i'm not going to kind of go into the lake size of of obviously descriptions of what you'd find in lakes so a journey through the depths of ponds as you can see my david hockney-esque artwork here that i uh, I, I did of uh, the, the kind of from the surface to the sediment and I always find that the different parts are just as fascinating and, you know, people prefer things that fly across the, the surface or just hang around there. And I suppose, you know, maybe some people prefer the creatures that you find in the middle or you get the real niche, strange people who might find the stuff in the sediment, the really weird stuff that no one kind of really talks about much that may find that fascinating. So I'm going to try and cover all of that in this presentation today. And we're going to go down 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 to the bottom so the the first part we're going to go through the surface what you'd find at the surface just a quick overview um as i said i won't go too into depth of some things because there's been other presentations if you go on to the tenipra youtube you'll find presentations by um by people who've done you know on uh dragonflies and, and such so i'm going to touch upon things and i've tried to cover things that other people haven't talked about so the middle of the pond or near the surface so you've got to be bit broad because some things go up and down you can't just restrict them so we're going to cover things there and then we're going to cover the things deep down near the bottom and, and and in the sediment and then we're going to talk about some of the things that i think are important when you start getting into entomology i'm sure a lot of uh, terrestrial entomologists will be able to comment on this you start to think about well actually i'm studying invertebrates but there's a lot of interactions with plants so there's a lot of interactions with these things and these things so actually you find a lot of people then start to you know understand other things to be able to understand invertebrates so i want to kind of just feed on that at the end about you know obviously it's great to have specialties but at the same time to always think maybe a little bit outside the box about those interactions with different things and then what fun activities are out there so um I've uh, I've got a video on on my Instagram actually, but I didn't put it into my slide, which covers the uh, the fun activities that you can kind of do in the garden, um, cre creating your own little 
pont, it's called. It's a pond pot. So we're going to talk about that at the end. And one of the creatures that popped up in my pont that I'm going to talk about at, at the end, which was re really weird. Um, so the surface. So as I've mentioned, we're at the top of the pond and we're kind of, we've walked over to it and what the sort of things that we're going to see. I've never actually seen a raft spider. Um, I mean, I'm sure there'll be many people on this, uh, on this workshop that, that would have. And, you know, it's those sort of different things that you'd find. I mean, I've only covered a few things here, but the sort of, if you walk over to a pond and you just see, you know, there's all sorts of diptera flies landing on the surface. There's, you know, dragonflies whizzing around. There's um, bugs, you know, spiders. There's so many different things on the surface. And one of the things that I, I, I've, I've been fascinated with uh, this summer watching is, um, is, is back swimmers. So um, the common species, um, Glauca, so uh, Nutanecta Glauca, it's, um, I didn't realize that actually when I first got this in a, a Petri dish and I saw how big its uh, mouth parts, its mandibles were, and I thought, wow, that, that looks like it's got quite a big mouth. And, um, and luckily I didn't put my finger in there because obviously they've, uh, <laughs> they've got quite sharp um, mandibles because obviously they're predators. So that was one of, the, one of the facts that straight away, you know, exploring the ponds, looking at them, um, the different morphological features or the different parts of their body that they have because of the things that they eat. So um, as I said, you know, the back swimmers that are, that are propelling themselves across the surface like a rowing boat, and they're catching a meal um, and catching everything from tadpoles to fish to, um, you know, different insects, all of the sort of different things that they'd expect to, uh, to find and eat. So it, it's quite amazing that a creature that size, you know, picking off small things like um, keeping fish populations in check. So keeping those, those fry, those small fish that are probably just saw their first bits of daylight have just been picked off and, and eaten by a, a, a rowing boat that's paddling across the surface of the pond. So yeah, that, that was one of the, the things I've become fascinated with this summer. But also, you know, you've got the bugs. So when we talk about bugs, not the, not the kind of American term, so the, the Hermitra, the Latin name for bugs. So the, the pond skaters, which do look very much like mirids, you know, the terrestrial miridae bugs that you'd get. So those slender, long mouth parts, which again, um, can be predators and they're going around, um, going around again, they all kind of look like different nautical boats. So you've got the back swimmers that are rowing boats and then you've got the pond skaters that are like some sort of um, yacht contraption that are like kind of skidding all over the place and they're capturing different insects and then using their long mouth parts like the uh, terrestrial bugs to um, to eat them with so the different well when we talk about dragonflies you know I know dragonflies the only time I've really seen dragonflies and damselflies um, you know landing on the surface of the water when they're when they're mating or if they're catching prey but you, you know the adult dragonflies you know they're surveying the surface of the water but really you know landing um because obviously they've spent all of that time underwater as a larva and then as an adult you know they're there to fly around and, and so they're surveying the surface of the water whereas the rest of the creatures that we've covered here are actually on the surface or just below the surface and using that that surface um as their, you know, their, their feeding grounds. And then obviously there's other spiders as well. So, the, you know, spiders that create a bubble that are able to go below the surface um, and go under the water. So there's, there's not just creatures that, that rely totally on the top of the surface, but there's ones that can go slightly under as well. And it's quite good, you know, I mean, obviously we're going into autumn now, um, but I went over to Ness Gardens on the Wirral um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was walking around the ponds and I could quite happily sit there and look at the different things that are scooting about and, and capturing things. And you always know, occasionally, if you wait there long enough, um, you will actually see things getting kind of eaten or captured and all sorts of amazing, interesting things. So we're going to go a bit deeper. We're going to sink beneath the surface and we're going to kind of go what, what you'd find 
just below the surface or kind of up to the middle because again it, you have to be kind of quite broad with uh, what you cover in these uh, different things and again some of these creatures you do find at, at, at the bottom as well so I did have to split it somehow so uh, I'm sure a few people are saying well you do find them in the sediment as well like snails so it's that kind of you know if there's macrophytes or aquatic plants in there you might find them in the middle if it's just sediment you know that might be at the bottom and it's co you know there's, there's creatures that travel you know between the different lengths depending on what they eat or what they're if they're hunting or you know herbivores eating plants so the sort of things that you'd see scooting around the middle or near the surface so the water beetles um i purchased uh the water beetles book of cheshire this year i know a few people picked that up and um some of the diverse environments that you find water beetles or when you start to read about um when they are able to uh, travel to different uh, ponds it's absolutely fascinating that the first part of this book describes about how um how the many the, the places the habitats and places where water beetles have been found everything from car windscreens to drain pipes to ponds in people's gardens and this is why it's fascinating when you when you have a pond in your garden you think how did that get there and so actually, you know, some of these some of these creatures that are able to spend their life within the middle of the, the, the pond and then it, and then when it's time to to leave and mate and move on, um, they're able to to get, you know, fly all that way out of a pond um, into someone else's pond or into someone's moth trap, probably. And uh, <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> so you think God, amazing how these creatures are able to move. So um, I've put two pictures up here of damselflies and dragonflies because I think really the, the morphological or, or physical differences between them both, not, not for all species, but if you was to kind of, if you was going to tell someone who's never seen them before, what do they, how do they look different? The damselfly larvae, very slender, long, elongated, um, similar legs to the the dragonfly but it's got that real slender elongated body whereas many of the dragonfly larvae have got that kind of um you know like a thumb uh kind of you know a bit more widened so like i said not for not for all species but it, if you can kind of get that picture in your head if you was ever to kind of do a bit of pond dipping or get a glimpse of something on a on a plant then you you know you'd be able to spot oh that's a damselfly oh do you know that oh, it's quite elongated and thin, um, so I mean if you're going to go into identify them down to species, you know you get yourself a book like this the Freshwater Guide to Invertebrates from the FBA website, and and you know it does kind of obviously they're separated by quite fine features so unless you was going to take them take them out. Um, and identify them properly. Some, uh, a lot of the time as well, it involves obviously um, killing them, which is not great. So this is why with dragonflies, it's a lot easier to, to identify many of them as adults or with the exuvi. So the exuvi is the, the casing that they come out of between larval and adult stage, which I'll touch upon at the end. So um, also look, really covering many larvae here, but we're also talking about water boatmen so the water boatmen Corixidae, unlike the 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 back swimmers that that kind of mainly stick to the surface the boatmen will kind of go you know like kind of up and down and and all around near the surface so and they feed on slightly different things as well so they can feed on on plants um or they can feed on algae diatoms protozoa uh, and small insects so kind of like the way that uh, when we think about interactions as well we think about if we think of the pond as a big channel and we separate it we're separating it into sections for different things to live so the the when we talk about competition and how things compete and we think about evolution and how things have changed over time. So like the back swimmers have dominate the surface and the water boatmen have decided that actually maybe it's instead of competing with these, we may as well kind of go maybe a little bit below, but obviously they do come to the surface as well. So um, I thought I'd put them and separate them for people to remember in two, in two separate sections, but you probably will see them both at the surface. Um, I've mentioned water beetles, but I'm going to talk about beetle larvae as well. So if you look up beetle larvae, there was a really good book that came out for the Royal Entomological Society this year. 
um, I'm trying to remember years, so it's been so long since I saw daylight, I think, um, that it, the beetle larvae, I mean, they're an amazing group of um, invertebrates, which are still very unexplored. I mean, a lot of the, they've done really well in that book to kind of cover many of the, the, the sort of ones that you're going to see but it also still leaves so many different ones because it's such a massive beetle larvae as well in terrestrial larvae, uh, terrestrial larvae. It's such a big um, pool that should be kind of looked at more deeply. So if there's anyone who's looking to do a PhD or, or further explore, I'd say, yeah, definitely go for larvae. There tends to be quite a lot of blank spots in many different uh, creatures, uh, larval um, literature. So, um, I've not included any pictures of beetle larvae on this slide because um, there's just too many pictures to include. I think really you can, I could go on and whiz through quite a lot of pictures, but I thought, cause everybody can see my face and I've got some really nice books in front of me. Um, I thought maybe I'd just show you some pictures of some different beetle larvae in, um, in my book as well anyway. So I'll probably be able to hold it up to the screen. So you can see, the sort of the you know the adult and the larval stage so a lot of the larvae look like many of the uh many of the terrestrial larvae so you're looking at that kind of maggot or worm like you know features um and they kind of i'd say mo many of them look very similar so you know i won't get you carried away but if you look at the diving beetle larvae that's probably one of the easier ones to look at it's got a huge um it's got a huge kind of head with big mandibles and you if you look up the um the beetle the diving beetle larvae on google or if you look it up on um in the res book you know that's one of the easier ones um that you can kind of look at there so yeah the, there's in the middle i mean again you might you'll probably find these in the sediment as well and and it's the same with the um the 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 snails as well so i've included the pond mud snail but obviously like it says pond mud it's found in obviously very particular habitats in mud so you could say you know it's in the embankment in the middle it could be in the sediment at the bottom but i've put it into this section because obviously snails as a group which i think are quite underrated um they're they're a really big group that are found in on macrophytes found in sediment found you know kind of all over on you know found near the surface um and um the the pond mud snail particularly i wanted to include because it's um a, a protected well sorry it's a, a red listed species which has been found in um in liverpool which i'm sure if you speak to um to ben at the biobank um there's a site not too far from the mersey biobank where they've recorded the uh, the pond mud snail, but also as well, if you go on the MBN and put in um, the pond mud snail and have a look, there's quite a lot of these little sites that have popped up where it's been found, and um, and obviously yeah, it, the reason it's declined so much is because of habitat loss. So habitat loss and it, it obviously prefers a very specific habitat as well. So obviously the the mud banks or the the mud it, the 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 pond would have to dry out quite a lot for it for the habitat to be right and then refill up like the sort of things you'd find before humans kind of dominated and and kind of started to alter habitats you'd get natural natural um, ponds that dry out and then refill um and so these habitats have kind of disappeared so i wanted to i wanted to cover that because it i think really snails I've I've got into snails a lot more this this well last last year, um, and there's um, there's another there's a new book and an identification book coming out from the um, the mollusk uh, mollusk society, the um, snail aquatic freshwater snail society, um, that uh, are bringing out a new identification book with lots of um, awesome pictures, and I I dropped them an email and uh, said how excited I was over snails, and they said. Uh, we don't really get many emails like this this is fantastic would you like to have a look at our book when we release it i said yeah i'm really excited let's go out and identify some snails they all look the same um many of them other than obviously some of them that have the ram's horn shape so again this um sorry not the rams let me just get the ram's horn shape up I may 
great snail but great pond snail which if you go to dinton pastures you uh, sorry um, rixton clay pits you'll be able to to see lots of the great pond snails so so you've got this sort of shell which is um obviously looks like the 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 fin of a whale so it's very very particular if you find this this type of snail which again you find these they tend to be on uh, rocks in rivers but many you do find from what i've been reading in the literature there's many of the same snails that kind of do say that you find them in ponds and you do find them if the water feeds into a pond so i've kind of kept it I've kept it there's the great ram's horn snail so i've kind of kept it broad to show you some different snails in case you did come across one that i'd not spoken about because it was main, mainly um only focused on rivers but it kind of made its way into to a pond so moving on it's question time so the tenipsha trust have got a polling system now on their uh on their webinar um workshop function so we've got uh, a little a little quiz i'm sure a lot of people find it easy but for those who uh don't have not come across ponds a lot uh here's a little bit of a, a go for you so which of these insects can breathe underwater and there's multiple you can pick multiple answers there and it's meant to be water boatman i've noticed not motor water boatman yeah 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 it's good it's good So I suppose you could say really that, you know, the definition of breathe, would it be uh, describing something that's got gills or it's got an ability to transfer water into um, a form of oxygen? So it's kind of a bit to think about some of those different creatures that go underwater to stay underwater for a while, maybe come back up to the surface. And then the ones that stay underwater until they maybe change into something else so i think yeah number, fantastic so dragonfly larvae got the highest there and um i did put in a little bit of a uh, uh a little bit of a um note on the first slide i think it was to say uh, what scorpions hold their breath underwater and come to the surface so uh, that was the only thing to get you thinking about is many of the 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 bugs or um some of the creatures that hold their breath underwater like tanks of tanks underwater so um like the water boatmen and the um the back swimmers that can hold their breath like tanks tanks of air and they'll go underwater and then come back up to the surface again but that's just it it wasn't there to catch anyone out it was more just to get you thinking about how how different creatures live in water right I think that's, I can close that down. So we're going, we're going deeper down now. So we're going further to the depths of um, the water and we're going to go down towards the sediment. And one of the things that I've included in my little, um, my little drawing was uh, the leaves actually. It's something that I um, learned about recently in terms of uh, fish is um is how important it is for leaves if, if fish are in ponds or lakes how important it is for for leaves to be in a uh, a pond or a lake and this this fact came out from a uh, scientific publication that came out of I think it was oxford and it was about that they measured the carbon biomass in fish that had had uh, lived in water bodies so ponds or lakes uh, that had leaves that fell from the trees into the water and that I think it was something like um, over 50% of their biomass was uh, was attributed to uh, the the leaves that had been breaking down in the bottom of the the, the pond so it, many you know you'll always see I mean it's not great to have lots and lots of leaves smothering your, your pond but I think many people scrape out the leaves instantly to get rid of those leaves well, you know, there is a lot of insects that actually break down those leaves as well and, and change those, you know, that carbon in the water. So they're breaking the leaves down and then that carbon is becoming sequestrated or it's becoming part of that, that water environment. 
So, you know, a few leaves to sink to the bottom doesn't hurt. So don't scoop them all out if you've got a pond and you're kind of like many people scraping the leaves off, off the drive. You know, when they hit the pond, maybe just leave a few to go to the bottom because there's a lot of creatures that prefer those leaves. And that was a bit of an experiment I did with my pond this summer. I put a load of things to create what sediment at the bottom to see what creatures ended up living in there. So reaching the bottom. Now, this is definitely my preferred area of uh, exploration because it's just so strange. There's just so much going on and so many different interactions and things eating each other and you know weird creatures that people can't identify and yeah it's just it's all just a bit bizarre and if anyone knows me in person i'm sure you know i gave a workshop at the beginning of the year for tenipster trust on um, freshwater uh, invertebrates um and you know i'm sure a lot of people hear me going on about um coronamid larvae and you know identifying them and how not many there's not many people who can do it there's not too much interest but actually there's such a vast amount of them and what so much we can learn and then obviously i put a picture of some mites eating a midge larvae well you say eating sucking the blood of the midge larvae in one of the pictures as well so um caddis fly i'm not going to touch too much upon um caddis fly larvae because um i know there's plenty of other people to provide workshops on just on caddis um a friend of mine, I think she's actually on the call, Sharon Flint um, and Craig McAdam and many of the other people as well in the kind of river fly world will be able to kind of feed on this a lot more. But it is important to remember because like a colleague at work in his pond in his garden, he said, oh yeah, I've got loads of uh, loads and loads of caddis in my, in my pond in my garden. And, you know, when you read through the, the, the guidebooks about the different caddis species, and obviously it says pond, you know, as well as stream, um, you know river lakes it's very very diverse but one of i'm sure i could probably be i'd be open to be um for someone to elaborate at the end but the um mainly uh the the one species that came across oh computer's there let me just cut out for a second um one of the the common species that came across um when we talk about caddis was the um, cinnamon sedges, as the uh, fly fishermen call them, or um, Limnophilus nanatus was one of the ones that, you know, if you kind of look, um, suggest that you do find it in ponds. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to find out a bit more about the diversity of, of uh, caddis fly in ponds, because a lot of the literature that, that I've looked at, and obviously sampling myself, I've not come across too many actually. And obviously spent a lot, I spend, a, so much time exploring rivers and brooks and so i'm so used to seeing caddis in those environments i definitely need to to kind of explore more um you know connected pond environments i'm hoping to go out to uh to the gowie meadows with the wildlife trust to actually do a bit of um, pond dipping at some point and um and kind of see what they've got what they've been recording over that diverse environments um Older fly larvae, again, you find obviously find them in uh, rivers, but they're, they're a kind of a, a novel one, which um, I've kind of left some of these open for you to explore afterwards and Google and, and look up some of these creatures. They're, they're real weird uh, looking. They look like a beetle larvae, um, but once you've seen, once you've seen one, um, you kind of then, you know, you'll always see them. You'll always remember them for next time. So I'll actually even bring up a picture in my, my book of an, uh, an older fly larvae. Um, so one of the one of the beetles actually that I didn't actually I forgot to mention about that you find on the surface and in the water and in the sediment was the elmids, which is uh, classed as a freshwater a beetle. Um, so I, I forgot to show you this picture. So the, the elmidae, which you know many coleopterists will know. Uh, elmids that you find we obviously find adults and larvae in um, in the sediment and in the water column and bimbling about on the surface so you tend to find them all over so they're quite a nice one to look out for um, depending where you are in the water whether it be on the surface or in the the um, the sediment so let me just find the um, older flies see alliday I don't know if you can see that picture it's quite small so there's there's um, an older fly larvae. So it looks like a beetle larvae, but 
as I said, after this workshop, do explore. I wanted you to explore more. And if you look at the patterns on the head, that's the, one of the key features you, that you can actually um, key them out straight away um, for, for um, Ciala Day, so for the older flies. They have a very distinct pattern on the, um, um, on the pronotum and the head, which you can kind of identify them quite quickly. And as I mentioned about the um, elmids as well, Obviously, in the sediment, you get the elmid larvae, which um, look very different to the adults. They look like many beetle larvae, so that kind of elongated maggot-looking um, shape. And then you find many of them, there's, a, there's not that many different species of, of elmids, if you wanted to kind of have a go at identifying them. Um, this book, actually, I didn't show you the front of it, but yeah, you can pick up this book from the FBA website. I think it's still in print. Um, elmids, and that's quite, an, quite a nice one to get going with if you want to get into identifying pond and um and river invertebrates so coronamids i could probably talk all day about coronamids but i won't kind of uh, excite other people too much about it uh so midge larvae and one of the, this is i mean the reason i think i like them so much is they're just everywhere and there's so many of them and they're so strange and then when you get into identifying them down to species level you have to do like a form of entomology dentistry so you have to actually look at teeth and count the teeth, look at the shape of the teeth, draw the teeth, look at how far the teeth are apart. And then you realize that you've become some sort of aquatic dentist and you actually with tiny little forceps moving these tiny mouth parts and kind of identifying them. So they're quite exciting when you start to look at them. I mean, I know a lot of people won't want to see one. Uh, ever again after probably being bitten by the adults or just finding them just too a bit too creepy but you know I've, I'm here to express my excitement for the aquatic world so <laughs> I've included it um, so I wanted to include them and um, and I will touch upon uh, some of the you know creating a pont I would say go on to my uh, my Instagram account after this um, and I'm also going to share some stuff with Liana to, for their Instagram um, so if you want to create a pond, uh, which is just basically a plant pot with a bin bag in it filled with water, you go get an aquatic plant from somewhere, obviously, hopefully a native one, you know, um, from a from a garden centre, you put it in, you get a solar pump, you put that, put that in and then you just see what happens. And, you know, within three days, I had chronomids living in there. And I think they visited me on purpose because I loved them so much, especially when it was something like week five of uh, lockdown being at home. I was like, oh me myself and the chronomids um leeches i mean leeches are a fascinating group so one of the things that many people don't know about leeches is that the medicinal leech is fully protected under the countryside um the wildlife and countryside act 1981 and that there's it's actually quite a rare species which you know you'd be lucky to see there's quite a few rec records on the peninsula of um london no if i can say it right my partner always corrects me on my welsh pronunciation um down on in north wales if you go on the nbn and have a look there's quite a few sites but it is i mean the um the pond um i'm trying to remember what they're called now uh the there's a conservation organization which will come back to me at the end they have like a recording form as well if you come across it to obviously report that to kind of obviously because it's quite a, a rare and obviously um, a protected species but that's fascinating really because obviously you know they've been used for centuries for medicine hence its name and now they're quite a rare anomaly you know and and i'd love to see one if i could if i could get out one of the leeches that i uh, wanted to mention um is if i can pronounce its name my name because my latin pronunciation is about as good as my um welsh and other pronunciation is uh there's a leech that falls into ponds and it falls from the nasal cavity of wetland birds and it's a tiny little leech that um it's it looks like a little um like a little m m or a little little just a little round like kind of sweetie shape and um it, it basically as a, as a youngster so it's called the mison testulatum and this leech as a youngster lives in the nasal cavity of, of wetland birds and it drops out 
and and it and it can obviously um, when it's older it feeds in the uh, vegetation lives on the stones and the vegetation sorry because it feeds in ponds but it lives on vegetation and stones but that might end up in your pond if it falls out of a wetland bird or a duck's nose and it falls into your pond and I've come across it I've come across it once I got to identify it and I thought it was amazing just this little kind of round sweetie looking leech but you can tell obviously I've got weird interests anyway so I won't go too much into the other things because I know obviously um, of time but uh, the crane fly larvae um, here that I'm going to show you so this is the the anal uh, the anal parts of a crane fly larva so I'm trying to kind of bring people into enjoying looking at larvae and this um, this chap that's done this blog which I always show people when I do conferences or I do events um, I always show people this picture because they just think it's absolutely brilliant so these are the obviously the rectum the real parts of of crane many of crane flies and this chap has decided to kind of animate them and look and actually I have I've identified one I think it was very much like uh, uh, nephrotoma, less nephrotoma, nephrotoma, um, versens. So I, I, I got one very similar to that and it was actually smiling and looked like a clown face laughing. So they actually do look like the real thing. It's not just kind of a bit of fun these. So if you're ever lucky to, to come across looking at the rear end of a crane fly larvae, then you might kind of find some of these fun faces. Some other weird facts about, uh, in, uh, you know, invertebrates rather than insects in ponds. So looking at, um, you know, uh, mollusks. So if we think about the swan mussels, so one of the interesting things I didn't know about swan mussels is they actually can't live in a pond or, or a lake without fish because the, the larvae um, are parasites that live on the gills of the fish, which I thought was quite interesting. So if you, I mean, the massive swan mussels, if you ever get to see one, this is me, I picked one up in out of a big pond that I was doing some uh, fish sampling in, and you'll only find them in, and I think they, they're species specific as well, the, 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 larvae, the, the, the larvae that feed a parasite on the gills of the fish. And then thinking about weird stuff as well, so nematodes, I, I quite like this cycle. So this cycle is from, from water to land, back to water, and it's uh, a type of nematode, which uh, MBM reckons that some people might have seen it, but I'm, I've never come across it. Obviously, it's, it's more common in uh, North America and other places. And you can see here that the cycle between um, in the cycle between invertebrates, water, land, and how they all kind of cycle round. So you've got this parasite, this worm that lives, uh, or it's not even, it's obviously, I've got it wrong there, it's not a worm, it's, it's a nematode that lives um, in the water. You do come across a, quite a lot of nematodes in, in water in ponds. If you ever pull something out that's a long looking worm, might not be a worm, um, it probably might be a nematode. And then obviously they lay eggs, which turn into larvae, which go into mosquitoes, which no one really enjoys, uh, into mosquito larvae, which then emerge, which then go into grasshoppers which then throw themselves back into water so that's the cycle of life i would say for that that slide so again the, the small things which i haven't covered obviously when we think about invertebrates in water we we think of um you know we think of like dragonfly larvae and all of the kind of common ones that people want to see um and it's those sort of things where you know, there's all the things that that go on, especially when you start to look down a, 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 a you know a powerful microscope, or even not even so much powerful microscope to see some of these. So, especially the Cyclops um, SPs, so the Cyclops species, you don't actually need a powerful microscope to see these. And one of the things that I came across when I built my my pond. And I started to see what things would fly in. I was hoping, obviously, some water beetles would fly in it, but they, they, they didn't. I, I got um, midges, you know, chronomids. And then I noticed that, that I got lots of mosquito larvae. I used to work with mosquitoes before I got a job at the Environment Agency um, and, and raised mosquitoes. So I recognized a lot of the, well, you obviously recognize mosquito larvae quite easily. But, um, and then I noticed the mosquito larvae trying to escape something that i couldn't really see very well and i thought what 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 are they dodging they're dodging something there and and as i looked a bit closer i could see 
um, a, a copepod, a water flea, chasing the mosquito larvae. And I was like, right, this is something I've never really kind of come across because obviously there's so much to learn about everything. And as you, you can see them chasing the mosquito larvae, and I thought, oh, well, they must, clearly they eat mosquito larvae. So I've got a video of that actually to show you along with another video at the end. Um, so yeah, they, it's the small things that I think people forget about. And if you, if you look at the, um, the water fleas, the water fleas are fantastic. Again, they're so weird and diverse. If you get yourself a freshwater life book and you start to look at some of the weird shapes and sizes of the, like, you know, when you come across the sea shrimp and all sorts of different things, there's some absolutely amazing things to see beyond the big things that we always assume should be in there. So by having a bit of water in your garden with a pump and some plants, I'm pretty sure that the, um, the, the cyclops species came from the plants um, and they came out and then started eating the, the mosquito larvae. And then I found a really interesting article where people have been putting the, the um, water fleas in pots, in trees, in water for mosquito larvae to lay in and then they eat the mosquito larvae to control mosquito species. So a, a quick quiz, probably uh, I want you to kind of look at the two pictures and come up with an answer. And uh, there's going to be a bit of a poll. So I'm going to go, you've got a picture of that, which looks like a horse, I think. Uh, I don't really know things before legs. And then there's a picture of something else, with wings. It's got six legs. I think it's an invertebrate. And then you've got a fish and something else. So put two and two together. What do you get? I've given you some selections. I can't say, I've only seen a horse flying monster once. And it was, it probably was in a book. Ah, oh, look at that. Winner, winner. Fantastic. Great stuff. Yeah. Oh, I think I've caught, I think I've, mm. it's good. It's good. Hmm. Right. I think um, it looks like most people have had a go, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, a horse, a horse fly larvae. Let's just end the poll so you can see the picture. Horse fly larvae and fish leech. So, I mean, I did kind of make it so, you know, there was a little bit of a challenge in there. So horse fly larvae, fish leech, not too exciting. So I didn't really put a picture in there of a horse, uh, of, of a fish leech, um, which again, it's in the freshwater life book. Looks like, I don't think the pictures in the, um, the, the, the drawings of pictures do, the, do any justice to leeches, I'm afraid. They all tend to look very much the same. So a fish leech at the very top here just looks like many of the other leeches, just a brown. That's the medicinal leech, that picture up there that's in the actual um, diagram. And then the horsefly larvae, again, go out and do some Googling of some of these creatures and have a look. Some of them are really weird looking, especially the whole larvae page in the Freshwater Life book. So moving on, we're coming to a close now nearly. So interactions. So I think it goes without saying that some of the interactions that go on within ponds um, are obviously really important because, you know, if you think that you've seen some in amazing species in a pond one year and you wonder why you've not seen them the following year and you think, well, what's happened there? Why, what, you know, what, what interactions have happened for them to disappear? And there's a, the, I mean, that's a white claw crayfish in that picture, but um, the, the signal crayfish that, that was introduced back in um, the 1980s, I think it was, in the, in the UK, was introduced from Sweden for people to keep in ponds. Uh, first introduced into someone's pond in Berkshire. And that people don't realise that actually, that, you know, crayfish now, they're, they're obviously across the whole country, even made it as far as Scotland, that don't actually have any native crayfish at all. And they live in, you know, rivers, ponds, lakes, wherever they can get to really, and they can move a lot across land. So when there's, when there's invasive species, this goes for plants as well, they do start to change the interactions that happen in ponds. 
So signal crayfish, they eat many invertebrates, but they're also omnivorous as well. So the plants, they pull up the sediment, they destroy the, the sediment for what, what would usually have lots of diverse sediment creatures in there. You can read all about them. They're, they're quite, a, quite a problem. And then, I, I mean, another, another creature dear to my heart, owl midges. So if you look up at the owl midge larvae, uh, you know, where they find. One of the things that I didn't cover when we talk about ponds, I wanted to cover, you know, random bodies of water as well that hold different creatures. So as I mentioned about the, the water beetles in here, there's the nice paragraph about where they end up and, and where they might, I mean, they might not survive for too long if that's not their natural habitat. But actually, owl midges the larvae tend to live in quite polluted water. Well, I say polluted. They live in drains. They're called drain flies. So they live in the drains. So I'm quite lucky when I sit down and have my evening meal, they all land on my patio windows and I can sit dazzled by them landing, the adults landing on the windows. And the larvae are found in, in that, that toxic kind of water. And it's the same with mosquitoes, quite diverse. They can live in kind of like pond water. They can live in um, quite toxic water, stagnant water, they can live, you know, and then obviously you've got like things like rat tail maggots of uh, the hoverfly larvae that lives in quite really toxic, quite, you know, uh, um, do take, when I say toxic with a pinch of salt, I'm not talking about, you know, heavily polluted water, I'm talking about water that's maybe not as clean as a pond. Um, so there's all these different types of water that hold different species and, and that niche so that specific environment and then also i've got this picture here this was a tray in my back garden over lockdown of just watching things that interact there and you know spiders coming up that aren't actually um that, that, that don't specifically feed on water eating things that were that were kind of flying off on the water there was lots of different flies showing mating behaviors on top of the water um and you know and let's not forget about the macrophytes and the aquatic plants as well that play an important part in breeding habitat you know food so there's all these different interactions when we think about invertebrates and the very bottom corner i've included there is actually uh, cyanobacteria so that's something i do as a, as a job i have to identify um, blue and green um uh, algae as part of my job to to basically protect the public and wildlife well you know animals that might enter water that's quite toxic so there's all these weird interactions in ponds um, and i'm sure you'll get to see lots of them when you're out wandering around so do appreciate the sort of different things that go on whether it be positive or negative last quiz so <laughs> i'd say pen's ready but it's all interactive these days so yeah you've got three creatures two of the creatures have already popped up in the slides and the last one is uh, one that we've not talked about. So have a go, see which ones you think they are. Um, I see that many people have had a good go at this. So if you can't remember the previous slides, um, one of the pictures I've mentioned, all I keep going on about is them. Uh, the, one of the other pictures we've talked about landing in people's drain pipes and on windscreens. And one of the other creatures that's in there is um it's got quite a nice name um I, I don't know what clue to give you for that one really so i think that's the final poll there liana if it could pop it up slightly a bit over time i apologize i'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions hopefully so yeah great ah fantastic yeah people yeah great yeah, fantastic. And I'm sure in the future, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely keen to probably start putting more things on YouTube. So maybe we could do some more specific material on some of these different groups going into depth rather than, you know, cut just this is more of a kind of a, a jump into the pond and see what we find as we go along. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so if you could just stop showing your screen now. Yeah, um, yeah. We're not live on Facebook anymore. So uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had quite a few questions on the chat. Um, we've I got some quite knowledgeable up, yeah. people here with us. So um, <laughs> I think most of them have been answered by each other, but um, I'll still pose them to you as well. Okay. Um, so from Sarah J, um, how do insects find a new pond? Do they smell or see a new water? a new body of water that's a really good question and uh maybe i feel a little underqualified to answer maybe i mean um yeah i'm not too sure about the pheromones like what moths use and, and many of the other 
you know creatures flying creatures that they use to to move around or light or the moon i think i'm not sure i'm sure if um i know sharon flint's on here she might be able to correct me but um i'm a guessing similar to probably the, the moths with like the water beetles it might be to do with the the moon um and where the light is now i'm not too sure about pheromones because um i mean looking at some of the creatures anatomy when i've identified them um i've not come across too much of their anatomy that suggests they've got pheromone functioning um as a larvae but then as an adult obviously when midges become adults you know they're completely different features so they'll find different water as, as an adult so i would say the ones that that transform into different creatures so from a larvae to an adult they'll have those um features that will either you know use either pheromones or, or light um and, and travel and then i'm not sure, quite sure of the other ones that don't change so like the bugs that that kind of stay as they are um that don't completely metamorphosis um you know how they kind of move <clears throat> maybe travel around i'm guessing they they fly and hope to find like many different animals in the animal kingdom take off and hope to find that they're going to land somewhere uh nearby hopefully some water nearby <laughs> So sorry if I can't answer that with more scientific background. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Sharon Flint. Um, pond restoration is on social media a lot at the moment. What do you think is good practice regarding this? Ah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I kind of touched upon, um, well, about that, like the kind of problems with, um, there's, I don't think there's enough pond restorations slash um creation or you know um protection especially you know this kind of linking um connectivity between habitats so you know ponds that are becoming isolated and you know the it's just i don't think it's a big enough topic you know seeing it in social media um and and promoting it that way in a positive way um i do know from um an environment agency perspective that they've now started to uh, look into uh, using ponds and lakes a bit more in terms of like um, the the understanding of um, how healthy an environment is. So maybe if it gets that kind of push from um, governance slash um, you know the regulation side of things to show why it's important that we don't need to be just concentrating on rivers. Uh, and those water bodies actually it's just as important to be considering ponds connectivity between ponds lakes and actually those habitats and um, structures uh, are just as important i think really they're just a bit harder to classify from a government perspective so i think that's why they don't get as much light they're seen as more of a um as, as a kind of a uh, a decorative kind of feature to a lot of people when really actually they're just as important as all water bodies and i think that i, I went over to rixton clay pits uh, a few weeks ago actually to to do some work um, on looking at the habitats there and the connectivity between ponds you know it's just such an important um piece of um environment that you know it's all right sticking one pond in you know like i'm sure like a lot of places where they go okay we've put a pond in we've done our job you know actually it's important to have lots of different ponds or natural ponds that are occurring in lots of different parts and and creating that diverse habitat so i think hopefully that answers um sharon's point so i think really if it was if it was made more into that kind of the higher up where into the kind of governance side of section i know um Jeremy, um, oh, what's his name from the Pond Pond Wildlife Trust? I can't remember what it's called. There's an organization that basically they're trying to push as much as they can to kind of get ponds recognized as, as you know, an important habitat and linking up with different organizations. So, hopefully, things like that will make it into governance. Um, and you never know what's on the horizon in 2021. Obviously, I can't say too much, but uh, yeah, I, I think that they'll probably be recognized a bit more in the future. Thanks, Sharon. It's not, I saw um, that you was on here. <laughs> we've got another question from Sharon as well. Um, oh, great. <laughs> do you think the CPET method could encourage coronamid recording and popularise this important group? Of oh. 
Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> that what an amazing question. So if you don't know about the CPEP method, which I'm sure many people don't because they've, they've actually just, um, so they've, they've stopped, uh, uh, well, I don't think we're going to use it. They're going to use it anymore in the environment agency. And they used to do courses at the FBA on CPEP. So CPEP is, um, Chronomid pupae exuvae, um, I can't remember what the T stands for, but it's basically looking at the exuvae like you will with dragonflies. And then from the exuvae, you know, you can kind of do the, the, um, the family identification. And then from that, you can kind of get a, a, a indices. If you don't know about um, indices, it gives you like a, um, a, a range of how, you know, um, how good this water body is so they use it on lakes they use it on like you know you can use it on windermere and places like big lakes like that and the environment agency has been using it for quite a long time and you just go out and you collect all, scoop all the exuvi you can get the nets from the um from the nhbs website uh who uh, suvi scraper and you just scoop it across the top and you get all of the exuvi you can do it in your pond in your garden as well and you put them in a petri dish and you look under a microscope and you look at them and you use the um the cpet book which is i think i've got it actually wherever i can find it somewhere ring binded somewhere wherever i can find it um so you, you can download it i think off the internet somewhere and using this book you can you can find out so much about the how healthy a water body is i think it's an amazing method and i think it should be used um globally i've been talking to someone recently about what, could they use it on lakes in africa um could they adapt it like they've done with other indices i think it should be used um jeremy briggs sorry i've just seen sharon flint's message jeremy briggs freshwater habitats trust is what i mentioned earlier um and it's yeah i think it's such an important method and i think that could be one that could be used straight away on ponds and you could see how um you know how health well i say ponds you know like a biggish pond you can see how healthy that pond is in terms of you know the the chemical interactions that are going on in there so yeah i think it could definitely be used um and i think it it should be there should be courses on it and i think there should be kind of more people using it so if anyone wants to get in touch about that i i've got the the guidebook and i'd be quite happy to share how you can do it and have a go at doing it and it's such a great method a lot of people enjoy doing it a lot of people might not enjoy doing it as well <laughs> but uh yeah so definitely get in touch with that one i put my email at the beginning i think okay um we've got a question from calf um, she says how do you tell the difference between medical and other leeches yeah so i mean the medicinal leech that's been used as a medical leech and then obviously they've they've bred um they don't obviously can't just go extract that from the environment anymore they've they've bred their own strain of um, medicinal leeches which uh it's the same when you know using um mosquitoes for experimentation they have very spe specific genetic strains of these creatures that they use you know so in medicine they'll use a very specific medical leech that's been bred you know inside for that use now the medicinal leech that i talked about the the one that's protected it, you know it, that's what was used in um, i don't know if, uh, victorian times and obviously before then um you know to for many different things to clean up wounds and that's where it was used before obviously now we live in an age where we can culture most things so i would say all of the leeches in here freshwater leeches of britain and ireland are not medicinal leeches they're they're just they're freshwater wild leeches um other than obviously the medicinal leech uh, they obviously do feed on you know um on different creatures but i don't think i should i don't want to confuse that with like you know people using them to feed on people and things like that so i would say you know don't get too confused all wild leeches feed on in different invertebrates and animals and then the medicinal leech that used to be used in medicine is not used anymore and they breed their own re leeches in uh, which i think they're starting to bring back a bit same with maggots as well um so like i said when i used to breed mosquitoes as a bit of a job i we had a very specific strain of mosquitoes it wasn't wild it was bought from somewhere that bred them from a very pure genetic strain that we could use in medicine so hopefully that answers your question. Do go out and have a look at some leeches. Leeches are fascinating. Again, another topic I think that could be covered in the future. Or if you want to get in touch, I absolutely think leeches are fascinating. 
um, and not too bad to identify once you've had a bit of um, a bit of help um, you know kind of so yeah I'll move on because I can see there's so many questions <laughs> <laughs> um, another question from Kath as well. Um, does a parasite cause grasshoppers to go onto the water surface? Because um, she's seen this. Oh, you've seen it. Fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, it does. So that, that specific parasite with the name, um, which I can go on. Oh, no, I'd have to share my screen again. But that very specific parasite um, that, that hosts in grasshoppers and mosquitoes. Yeah, it does. It throws itself on the water. That's why I quite, thought it was quite fun to add into a slide. Because it's like the circle of life in ponds that it spent its life in the water, uh, gone into a mosquito, gone into a grasshopper, and then made the grasshopper throw itself back into the pond. So yeah, it, it does. And if you've seen it, that's amazing. Because on MBN, if you put in that parasite, there's been pictures of different nematodes. I mean, nematodes. So, you know, you'd need to do DNA, I imagine, to identify a lot of them. So you know it's they've put them on as nematodes and they've put pictures on there so yeah it's amazing that you've seen that calf well done i mean i'd love to have seen it um or if you go on youtube you can watch a lot of videos of people filming them throwing themselves um i, I caught a grasshopper in sweden once and put it in a bag to take back to the lab to um pin and uh, by the time I got back, it exploded with that nematode, I think, inside it or, or another nematode. And it was uh, yeah, quite a mess. So it didn't go in my pinning box when I was in Sweden. Um, but yeah, nematodes are cool. Parasites are really cool as well. They're just weird. And there's a lot of weird stuff on, the, on, on YouTube of that as well. So yeah, moving on. So I can see more questions coming through. Oh, uh, I, I just say, thank you. Sharon in the chat has, has, has posted the Freshwater Habitats Trust. So it was honestly, it was on the tip of my tongue. So it's talking about the Freshwater Habitats Trust. They offered the form. If you ever come across the medicinal leech, they also offer lo lots of amazing information on ponds um, and, and lakes. And they're doing some really interesting work on stuff like, you know, um, trying to connect habitats. They've done work with the Environment Agency and built new habitats and all sorts of different stuff and things as well. So thanks for sharing that, Sharon. Duck leech, yeah. So that's so this woman's put the duck leech on there. The myzon testulatum, that's the duck leech. Yeah, that's really cool. Check that out. You want to look it up on you on uh, Google. It, it, what questions would you like me to answer next, Liana? Um, we've got a question from Rod Hill. He says, considering the zones shown for the pond, are the sides of the ponds important or classed as another zone habitat? Sorry, can you repeat that? I cut out. <laughs> Considering the zones shown for the pond, are the side of the pond important or classed as another zone habitat? Ah, that's a good question. And I think if I if I got could scan a lot of the pages out of this freshwater um, freshwater life book, there's actually an amazing diagram in the front that kind of shows you the zones. And if you start to get into um, macrophytes and identifying macrophytes. These are also then put into zones and all these different zones have different creatures living in them. So I, I think that every, every different, let's say, zone is, is super important and it also then has different creatures. So, you know, like the raft spider might live more near the bank or, you know, the, um, the, the different um, bugs that might live more you know what uh, specific sides of the pond and the plant zone eight well when it talks about plant zonation i think you can pretty much associate that with invertebrates as well because many invertebrates are tied to a lot of different plants due to feeding on um, other species that hang around plants you know so we've talked about um, protozoa or you know algae or you know feeding on those different creatures zooplankton that all live around plants so they're actually going to be found in certain zones and i don't think i might be able to show you it there so it says plant zonation and then it's sectioned in the freshwater life book and i would say every single part of that diagram is just as important as the other parts because it has different creatures i say creatures because obviously we're talking about all sorts of different things aren't we from nematodes to parasites to you know invertebrates to to well obviously you know uh, many are invertebrates but to insects and and different things so you'll find that if you're looking at a specific group it might just be found in one of them zones 
um, especially things like, you know, things that just eat zoo zooplankton. They're found where macrophytes are, and it might be found where sub um, semi-submerged macrophytes are. So they're the plants that live halfway underwater and halfway above the land, which are only found near the bank. Or they, they might be found at the bottom where there's, you know, some sort of specific interaction. So they'll be found in the deep water. So yeah, it depends what you're looking at. And I think every part's just as important. And I think you definitely grab yourself one of these Collins Freshwater Life books. It's got everything from plants to, it's even got fish and amphibians and all sorts of stuff in there. So, right, Diana? Um, we're officially supposed to finish now, um, but if people are okay um, to stay, um, are you okay to carry on answering questions? I am, <laughs> yes. I, um, I, I took the afternoon off work in case anyone was keen. <laughs> Mainly, to, I'm only talking about midges for the rest of the day though, is that all right? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> I'm yeah. to answer all the other questions. <laughs> people are on. allowed to leave if they want to, <laughs> to feel obliged to say. <laughs> on, on that note, yes. <laughs> no, 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 carry on, um, carry on. I see uh, Zoe. Zoe's put about um, about the duck leech. So that 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 leech. I think yeah, the duck leech. So in here, I just I'll just read you the description of what it says in here about this leech. So it says, um, "Thomisin testulatum." So young leeches are ectoparasites on the wall of the nasal or buccal or buccal cavity of water birds, but are also found on vegetation. So I mean, it says water birds. So I mean, you're not wetland birds. So you you are right. It, I mean, um, the duck leech would make sense that it, it's found on, um, on water birds rather than wetland birds. So yeah, just to clarify on that one. Cool. Sorry, go on. Okay, yeah, so no. Ruth Bennett says, I have had a moth caterpillar living in my pond this summer, eating water soldier um, plant leaves. How common is this? As she's never seen it before. That, I mean, that'd be a first for me. I don't know if there's, if there's anyone else who might be able to comment on this, but no, I mean, that, that, these are the sort of things I would say. I mean, I'd have to look into it afterwards. I won't be able to comment on it straight away. But these are the sort of things where if you, if you video some of these interactions, and, and I think this is where I meant, when I mentioned about interactions, if you video some of these different things and you take pictures, they are definitely worth following up. Now, I, I might be able to, it, we could, cinema moth larvae right so definitely i'd have to look into it afterwards china mark moth so it can be super abundant in ponds and lots of right okay so i'm, I'm not too familiar with that but I, I mean i'd definitely be happy to chat about it afterwards if, if you want to chat about it afterwards but these are the sort of things where you definitely want to take pictures of anything where you just think that's a bit weird um you definitely want to maybe like video it because then afterwards you can then like look these things up and you can get in touch with different people uh, and try and find out if it is common and if it is the sort of normal thing that would be happening i am I'm, I'm not come across this so I'm, i mean whether someone like steve who's on the line no steve shaking his head for no <laughs> so if you know these sort of strange things where if people have come across them but like i said if you want to chat about it afterwards i can try and dig it out of my much literature i've got and see if we can find something on it because it sounds fascinating um, but definitely take pictures definitely take videos because like i said the, the cyclops thing that i had i was like what this is I, I, so i videoed it and then afterwards you know kind of looked it up and then found this whole kind of all this information about they actually hunt mosquitoes and all sorts of stuff so i'm sorry if that wasn't the answer you uh, um okay water lily breeders warn about china moths is China moth invasive? No, right. Then, I mean, you can tell I don't know a lot about moths. So now I honestly I can't comment anymore, I don't think, on it. There's no point in me even trying to guess what to say. It'd be something worth looking into. And this is where going to, well, obviously we can't physically do it at the minute, but if you went down to, you know, the the walking sessions at the Mersey Biobank or, or record at, Ch uh, at Chester, um, you know, you can kind of ask these questions to people who have got a wealth of knowledge. And that's how I've learned a lot of my stuff, especially through work as well. I love it. So he's, he's put a link on there as well to uh, Britain's aquatic moths. Right, there we go. I think there's something I need to explore after this uh, webinar and have a look at aquatic moths. There's something, again, th there's so much to learn. And I think you choose what you want to kind of end up exploring. And it's just, it'll probably take me till, I mean, I'm 34 now. It'll probably take me till... Um, at least 60, I think, to come back and ask me that. Maybe when I'm 60, I'll know everything. 
hopefully. <laughs> right, so I think I'll, we'll take another question. Sorry if that wasn't as helpful. And again, if you want to chat afterwards, I'll be more than happy to try and help you find the answer to your question. Okay, thanks. Um, Sarah J says, we have several new ponds as of this year and are new to ponds. What is the single most important thing we can do to attract some really good pond insect life? That's a really good question that is because I think that's like on the lines of um, you know that habitat um, you know restoration or um, habitat kind of building habitat and it's about creating that diverse ecosystem so it can support itself. So as I mentioned um, in a few of my slides we talked about plants and we talked about um, you know what what's in a pond the sediment and you know the, the things that can kind of live in there and I suppose it's it's about having that diversity so it can kind of not be overwhelmed by something specific so I noticed someone put, put on the chat about uh, on the chat that, that they've had an absolute um, you know outbreak of of um, of glaucas across you know so that's an overbalance of a species taken over a pond so I think creating a, a diverse balance in that pond is the starting point and the first thing I would do is is I would find native plants to put in that pond now um, I know this from having to having to learn about creating ponds for fish for fishing that that you can even if you haven't got the ability to put in plants into the bottom of it because it might not have that structure to kind of support submerged plants at the bottom you can get um, plant rafts so you can get these things they're like called like bio islands i think um, where basically they're like a raft of plants that root into the water and and they basically act like they're they're living in the water um on the water surface and some of them you can get semi-submerged and they and they can kind of provide macrophytes and plants in there if you can't put them in now obviously i'd rather you'd, i'd suggest you put them in so having some sort of substrate at the bottom sediment you know with with some rocks and pebbles and mixture of sediment um, and then putting in some of those macrophytes and one of the one of the things that i think is really important when we think of ponds my picture is just basically a massive drop um now that 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 won't be the most ideal environment really because as you should see in the picture in the freshwater um the freshwater life book it's about having that gradient coming in and out of the pond so like many ponds people tend to create ponds and they brick them off and they just go straight down and they don't tend to have any bank and then so actually having plants and other things live in there other than fish um, is quite difficult because you've just created a big pot so i would say some sort of bank or some sort of gradient in there now usually that you're best off doing that when you fit before you've put a pond in because then you can create steps that go down and then you can put a liner and you can create a, a drop into it so you need some sort of um, gradient with with plants and then semi-submerged plants fully submerged plants and even floating plants because the floating plants like the lilies create that important shade for many of the creatures that need that shade but there's also daylight for many of the other things so you're creating that balance then and then the different invertebrates or kind of um, the detritivores that break down the different plants and kind of start to circulate the dead plants that fall to the bottom and then start to create sediment at the bottom. And that's what that sediment will create from the plants. So you don't actually need to chuck in tons of sediment or anything at the bottom. You can start to let it build up itself. And I think from that pond, that plant, <laughs> pond pot pond that I created, I didn't have any sediment in it. I just had plants and within about, six weeks i had a form of sediment at the bottom from the plant breaking down and all and the midges and everything breaking down the set breaking all the plants and and creating that sediment at the bottom so i won't worry too much about sediment that'll come but the plants are important now if you haven't got the banks then i would say looking at some of those bio island raft plants and that'll probably be the closest you could come to putting plants in there and there'll be interactions with those plants um, with different invertebrates make sure you check where you get your plants from as well because a lot of them do come with uh, added surprises inside them if you buy them from not the best plant supplier they'll come with all sorts of things and that's how a lot of invasives have spread in the past so hopefully that'll help again if you want to talk more about ponds afterwards and uh, and pond creation i'd be more than happy to to discuss things 
um, if people want to get in touch with me, I'm more than welcome to, more than open to, to emails as well. I love talking about this sort of stuff. So hopefully that um, was helpful. Yeah, is it okay if I send your email address out in the follow-up yeah, email? Yeah, so? definitely, yeah. I did put it on the first slide, but I'm sure that's obviously like gone now. So yeah, if you want to share <laughs> it with anyone, um, more than happy to chat about any subject. Give me a couple of days to reply because obviously I'm quite open to a lot of everybody emailing me. So I get lots of emails, but I definitely will reply. And I love talking about, especially pond for me. I mean, I'm, I'm like a lab scientist in a way where I spend all my time looking at dead things down a microscope. And so I, I love the actual getting out and seeing the real habitats. Like when people mention about, you know, habitat creation and ponds, this is something that I'm starting to do a lot more of now because you know, I've learned all of the taxonomy and the, the being in a lab and looking at dead things, but actually getting out and looking at that habitat and doing things like walkovers um, and looking at the habitat and how it connects uh, and going out to, to see what's there. That's so important. And that's something that I think more people should get into. So maybe next summer, hopefully COVID permitted, might kind of do maybe something, maybe suggest something to Tenipture where we go out and look at some ponds or something. Um, Okay, great. So if, yeah, moving on, I think, if, if, if um, that was helpful. Yeah, you might have already answered this question, um, <laughs> but you might have not. Um, we've got a question from Carolyn and Stephen. Um, what's the best time of year to clear vegetation from a clogged up pond? Oh, that's a good question. So, I mean, um, like most, um, most invertebrates and animals that tend to kind of breed, you know, spring, springtime through to summer and then in, and then in autumn things tend to slow down so you know i mean there is hibernating things that you'll find so you know but many like especially amphibians tend to overwinter not in actual ponds so i think in the winter and kind of late autumn you know or february time so you're looking at you know october november usually quite wet to go out or I usually tend to find that, you know, February, March time or February time, you know, before things start to get active. But you have to do be aware that there is obviously a lot of overwintering invertebrates that you might end up disturbing anyway. So I would say the best thing to do is, is when you're clearing out any of the vegetation, is pull it out, put it in a bucket with some water, um, give it a shake, leave it there for a little while, see what comes out. And, and starts to go, oh, what's happening here? <laughs> I've just been removed from my house. And then scoop them up and put them back in because you will find that will happen. Um, things like I was reading about um, a while ago that um, back swimmers, you know, that people had observed them uh, slowly, like kind of slightly active, moving under ice. So, you know, it's that these the bugs that kind of, that, that are around all year round that are slowly growing over winter that have not pupated into something else. They're still in there somewhere. They're just kind of, you know, in torpor or a form of, um, you know, hibernation. So it, it's that kind of, they're hanging around. So I would say definitely go for the winter whenever you choose, pick a dry day. And then I would then put your macrophytes or your plants that you're going to remove in a bucket or a bowl, a washing up bowl, um, give them a shake, see what emerges and then put them back into the pond before you before you kind of have them because i've seen so many times my partner's friend who's got a pond with loads of amazing stuff in it and they've just been dragging out all the weed in the summer and lobbing it on the uh, on the on the grass and all he sees all these things crawling out going oh my god what's going on <laughs> like trying to get back in the pond and slowly dying and I, I sent i said to her can you send her a message and just say put them in a bowl of water first because it's like there's all these things that are like living in there and you've dragged them all out so yeah even in the winter throw them in some water i think that's the key role there we're moving on i think because to see it's great to see so many questions <laughs> yeah, a lot of chat today <laughs> So I think we've answered most of the questions there. There's probably one or two um, that were missed, but were probably answered by people in the chat anyway. Um, great. So yeah, thanks again, Aaron. And oh, great. thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if people would like to rewatch the presentation, it is on the Northwest Invertebrates Group um, Facebook page now. And we will send out a link to the YouTube recording. 
Um, our next webinar is next Saturday on the 17th, which is on millipedes um, by Paul Richards. So please do sign up to that and join us if you can. Um, so yeah, thank you and have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>